Good. So please uh, go on, uh, Subir. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak at this meeting where I see there is a lot of active discussion. And uh, I would, uh, think it's also an honor for me to speak uh, in memory of uh, Pierre Benitri, who was a good friend and colleague for, I think I've known him for over 25 years. And uh, most of the time we actually discussed French bureaucracy because he was <laughs> the French representative in a EU network, which I coordinated. But uh, one thing that I gathered about Pierre was that he was very open-minded towards new things. And today I would like to tell you about uh, something rather new, which I think you would have appreciated. Uh, this is going to be a, a very uh, empirical, observational focused talk. So, uh, we are going to discuss the standard cosmological model. And here is a Hubble volume trillion particle simulation from dark sky of what such a universe is meant to look like in the model. So as you see, it is uh, not exactly isotropic and homogeneous, but it is statistically isotropic and homogeneous uh, because of the little fluctuations that are imprinted on the metric at early times. And so uh, this is now the centenary of Friedman's uh, uh, equation from 1921. And he assumed the uh, uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metric and plugged it into Einstein's equation, thereby simplifying it from 10 down to just one, the Friedman equation, which tells you the expansion rate in terms of just three components. So there is matter and curvature and lambda. And uh, if I divide throughout by uh, H naught squared, I can write it uh, suggestively in terms of the fractional contributions to the critical energy density of these three components. And as you all know, uh, the lambda term actually has two contributions, uh, one from the left-hand side, which comes from general coordinate invariance. And there is also a contribution uh, once you consider the energy momentum tensor to be not just classical dust, but also having contribution from quantum fields, because then you have the super renormalizable uh, zero point fluctuations and they contribute uh, therefore as well and you uh, have the sum of these two entering into the cosmological equation and this of course is the uh, well-known uh, cosmological constant problem as to how these two terms which don't know about each other in a random background in an arbitrary background could be uh, of the right uh, order to influence just cosmology so as to give us a, a universe that lives for 10 billion years. But nevertheless, this is our standard cosmological model and it can summarize it in terms of this sum rule, which just follows from rewriting the Friedman equation. And you all know the story because this lambda has uh, negative pressure. Uh, you can drive accelerated expansion since this term can, second term can overcome the first. And uh, we have several sets of evidence, uh, primarily from uh, the uh, Hubble diagram of supernovae, which measures this combination of omega min matter minus omega lambda. Uh, we uh, see the sky in the cosmic microwave background, and after some manipulation, we managed to uh, convince ourselves that it is totally isotropic with little fluctuations. And here is the power spectrum of those fluctuations. Uh, the typical angular scale is one degree, as you can see in the picture. And that corresponds to the sound horizon at last scattering. And that is a measure of the curvature of space-like sections. So omega k, we believe, is close to zero. And then you have measurements of the matter density from various sources, very uncertain, but they all uh, focus on a number uh, considerably less than one. And uh, this, therefore, gives us our standard cosmology in which we don't measure lambda directly, but we infer it from this sum rule to be of order uh, one. So lambda is therefore of order H naught square, since that is the definition of omega lambda here. Now H naught is 10 to the minus 42 GeV, an infrared scale, uh, and it's also changing with time. It's clearly not fundamental. Uh, nevertheless, we have uh, accepted this to be something fundamental, and we construct an energy density by dividing that by eight pi G multiplied by Planck mass squared. So we get something which is the geometric mean of the Planck scale and the Hubble scale, and that's about uh, 10 to the minus 12 GeV. Uh, 
And this is the standard cosmological model, which is based ultimately on this assumption of isotropy and homogeneity. And this is uh, completely acknowledged in the literature. So here is a excerpt from a textbook, which highlights the fact that the universe uh, has to be assumed to be uh, describable on average as isotropic and homogeneous. And then you infer that there is acceleration and we call that uh, generally cosmological constant or more generally dark energy. And the scale of this uh, dark energy is the only dimension full parameter in the Friedman equation, which is this Hubble parameter. And uh, certainly to me, it makes no physical sense. I doubt it makes any physical sense to anybody. Nevertheless, this is the basis of the standard cosmological model because this value for lambda is imposed on it from that sum rule, which is essentially going back to the uh, assumption of isotropy and homogeneity. Now, what puzzles me is that, of course, when you start out, you may have to make a simplifying assumption. And, uh, but as time goes on and you gather data, then it behooves us to go back and examine those assumptions. And this has been the case, as we well know, with the standard model of particle physics. Uh, it's also based on somewhat arbitrary choices of uh, you know, matter content and gauge symmetries and so forth. But they have all been tested at the quantum level, uh, at left, for example. However, in cosmology, in spite of all these major satellites and telescopes uh, collecting lots of data, um, I do not find the same interest in going back to look at the foundational principles. So, you know, this uh, here, of course, is WMAP and Planck and Euclid, and here is the slow digital sky survey, and here is the DAISY, forthcoming DAISY telescope, and here is uh, Rubin telescope at the very bottom. Uh, this has a I don't know, a few hundred page long sort of white paper, science case. I went through it and I found just half a page in that entire document talking about uh, you know, tests of isotropy. Now, why do you need to test this? Why can't we just look out and observe the sky and deduce something? That's because we are stuck at one point in the universe. We can't move somewhere else and check if the universe is the same there as it looks from our point of view. And we already know from studies of the cosmic microwave background that there is something called cosmic variance. We live in a fluctuating density field. So what you see depends on where you are. And this is particularly important at low multipoles, large angular scales, because you make only two L plus one measurements for a given L. But uh, when it comes to constructing the metric of space time in the whole, we have always uh, assumed that uh, our position is not special in any way. And this has been dignified by the name of the cosmological principle. Uh, it actually goes back earlier than uh, this to Einstein. But uh, the person who gave it this name was Edward Milne. He was, in fact, the Rouseball Professor of uh, Mathematics at Oxford. And uh, if you look at the discussion of this principle in the bit later, in the mid 50s, uh, in fact, uh, Littlewood says that uh, Milne's kind of restricts the principle because he only talks about our not having a special position in space. But in fact, we should generalize it and say there is no special position in time either. And that, of course, was the perfect cosmological principle of Bondi and Gold. And that was ruled out because we discovered the cosmic microwave background that tells us that we had a hot, dense beginning, a finite age of the universe. And uh, therefore, we abandoned the steady state theory, but we have stuck to the cosmological principle when it comes to space without actually testing it. And the real reason, as Steve Weinberg says in his textbook, which many of us learned relativity from, that it's really because uh, we don't have much data, so we have to start with something simple. But he says in this uh, chapter on cosmography in his textbook, that we must test and the data should fit into this framework because otherwise we have come to a rather astounding conclusion that either the foundation of the cosmological model or the foundation of general relativity is wrong and nothing could be more interesting. So, you know, you might think that this uh, it would be a key target for cosmologists. And yet, uh, as I'll discuss, very little work has been done on this. The reason why we believe work should be done is because the sky is not actually isotropic at all. And anybody who has, in fact, observed the microwave background will know uh, 
that there is a huge dipole anisotropy, which is much, much bigger than those small scale fluctuations that you are always shown a power spectrum of. And this was in fact predicted by Dennis Sharma uh, back in 1967. This paper of his, by the way, has 18 citations. And then uh, Peebles and Wilkinson said, you can understand this pattern uh, as a special relativistic effect. If you are an inertial observer moving through a isotropic black body background, then you will see a temperature according to the angle uh, given by this formula where beta is our velocity. And since the fluctuation in the temperature is a milli k, uh, the velocity is also about thousandth of the speed of light. And therefore we conclude that we are moving at 370 kilometers per second with respect to some frame in which the CMB is isotropic. And in that frame, all those equations I showed you actually hold, and you can do the standard cosmological analysis. However, we are not in that frame. And the first question you should ask is, if the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, then why are you moving? Because every point should be equivalent. Now, the answer to that is, of course, we have grown up, we realize that we are not perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, there are fluctuations, and there could be some local thing that is pulling us on small scales, of course, we don't see the Hubble flow, Andromeda nearest galaxy is falling towards us. And so we expect some deviation, some peculiar velocities. But the belief is in the standard model that if we average on scales larger than something, then we should get the uh, description to be close to the original uh, isotropic homogeneous model. And that scale is meant to be of order 100 megaparsecs. I'll quantify that statement in a minute. Now, this uh, dipole in the CMB was, as I said, predicted. And here is a paper from 67 by Stewart and Sharma, which explicitly says that uh, if the radiation is uh, cosmological and isotropic, it will only be so to an observer who is at rest in the frame of distant matter which scattered the radiation. And Sharma already knew that uh, uh, there is irregularities near us, there are peculiar velocities. So he predicted that we should see about a milli k dipole. And soon afterwards, this was in fact detected. And here I have a nice plot from George Smoot's novel lecture, where he shows the different components of this velocity. Uh, so of course, this is the Kobe measurement, uh, but never mind, we are basically measuring from Earth. And the Earth is, of course, moving around the Sun. So every measurement is made in the heliocentric frame. That's where we are. But uh, the Sun, the solar system, is in fact moving around the Milky Way in the opposite direction to the one in which we are moving towards the CMP. So these two velocities add up. And the net motion of the local group uh, is actually more than 370. It's like 620 kilometers per second. And it's in this direction which was believed to be due to an object called the Great Attractor, as Dressler named it, which lies at some distance uh, of the order of 100 megaparsecs, and that is pulling us. Now, if this story is true, then we should converge to the Great Attractor. If we map out the universe out to that scale, we should achieve homogeneity. We should achieve the frame in which the CMB is as to drop it. Is this the case? Well, first of all, let us remind ourselves that we actually have, uh, thanks to these uh, lovely, uh, beautiful measurements that have been made in cosmology, a very good understanding of how structure has formed in the universe through gravitational instability uh, of those little fluctuations that were imprinted on the CMB. Uh, and in order to make this work, you need about six times more matter uh, in a dark form, which doesn't interact with radiation. Uh, but if you give me that, then uh, the, uh, uh, there is enough time for uh, the fluctuations to go into the cosmic web that we see today. And uh, the origin of these fluctuations is not understood. We just have a placeholder there called inflation. But of course, uh, we don't have a physical model for that as yet. But as we heard in the last talk, uh, there is a lot of interest in developing a physical model tied to particle physics for where that phase came from. But uh, at least we understand gravitational instability. This is just uh, perturbed Einstein's equations. And we also have mapped out our local structure rather well. So here is a picture from Brent Tully and his collaborators uh, who have done this for many decades. And what they're showing is uh, our local region, about 200 megaparsecs. This is in velocity units. That is the natural uh, unit of measurement in cosmology. But it corresponds to about a box, a few hundred megaparsecs on the side. 
and we are at the center, we are in the falling, falling towards Virgo, but we are moving towards the shapely supercluster. And uh, the uh, speculation was that it is shapely that is responsible for pulling us. If that is the case, then our peculiar velocity should fall off as one over R as we converge to the CMB frame. And we have to do that, otherwise we cannot use those equations that we started out with that Friedman wrote down 100 years ago in order to do cosmology. Now, let me take you through a little exercise. This is the only maths I have in my talk, just to show you how robust this argument is and how simple. So if I just consider a density perturbation and ask how it grows uh, uh, according to the Poisson equation, subject to continuity and Euler's equation, then this is the equation taken from Peebles's textbook on large scale structure. And uh, we, of course, only want to look at the growing mode. The important point is that uh, there is no curl in the problem. We are talking about uh, something driven by a potential. And so the gradient, uh, uh, the velocity, the acceleration, everything, nothing changes in time. It's always in the same direction because the growth is self-similar. So how do you calculate the peculiar velocity field? Well, that's just Newton's law. I just calculate one by R squared, which is in this uh, kernel here. And uh, I can therefore write, work out this peculiar flow uh, which is just the trace of the shear tensor for those uh, experts here. And that uh, in practice to measure that, I have to use some kind of a filter, some kind of a, a selection function, which is dictated by the astronomical survey. So for example, if I have a, a volume limited survey, you can see intuitively it has to be some kind of a, a, a top hat function. And uh, I then calculate this. And from that, I know what the uh, fluctuations will be in the velocity. So it's much simpler to do all this in Fourier space. So I just expand that uh, density perturbation in plane waves. And now we have the wave number K and that top hat, now the uh, Fourier transform of that looks like this for those who know these things. And supposing I want to know what is the variance of the Hubble parameter from point to point, that would just be then given by this integral. So instead of delta of K, I now have its power spectrum. So this is something you actually can measure in the sky with galaxies. And then assuming some bias, you can relate it to the dark matter, which is actually driving this peculiar velocities. And the physics uh, is this growth factor F, which just tells you how rapidly fluctuations grow under gravity. So this is all linear theory, very straightforward, no, no ambiguity at all. So I hope you will find it convincing. And what that exercise tells you is that the fluctuations in the Hubble parameter at a scale exceeding 100 megaparsec are down to the percent level. This is, remember, for a idealized Gaussian random field universe. This is not necessarily the real universe. We'll have to check if the real universe is doing this. Uh, today, I will not talk about the Hubble parameter, but I'll talk about the peculiar velocity, which is a similar integral, a different kernel, but the same power spectrum. And what I want to emphasize is that regardless of what power spectrum you take, you get roughly the same answer because as you can see from this integral, you're smearing it out over all of K space, integrating from zero to infinity. So it doesn't really matter exactly, you know, even if I put a pump in the power spectrum, which is the case in this uh, dashed line, it still gives the same answer. And the uh, lesson I want to take away from this exercise is that uh, according to this, if I read off from here at 300 megaparsecs, the peculiar velocity, the variance in it, that's the variance being plotted here, it should be less than 100 kilometers per second. The velocity should die away, we should reach homogeneity. That is the standard story. Is that really what happens? Well, some years ago, we decided that you would actually get into this measurement of peculiar velocities, which are very difficult. You normally need uh, independent distance measurements. But thanks to the interest in supernovae, there were now catalogs of supernovae, such as the Union 2 catalog, which has something like 545 supernovae and uh, uh, with magnitudes that were measured quite well. And so what you could do is uh, tomography of the Hubble flow. So we divided space into shells of uh, different you know, redshift intervals. And in each shell, we asked if the host galaxies of the supernovae are at the expected distance according to their luminosities or further away or closer by, or, or equivalently, if they're brighter than or less bright than uh, the expected luminosity at that distance. And when we did that, 
we saw a clear dipole in the uh, uh, flow. And this exercise was repeated a few years later uh, by the supernova factory collaboration, which is led by Saul Perlmutter. And uh, Fine did his thesis on this, this paper, which shows that they essentially they produced uh, uh, with better statistics what we had because they had added uh, something like 279 more supernovae uh, in the uh, redshift range between about 0.04 and 0.1, uh, which were lacking in Union 2. And they see a clear dipole, and you see here, this rejects isotropy with a p-value of 0.03, which is fairly significant, and you get a bulk flow of about 250 kilometers per second. If you go out to a higher redshift, this was in the redshift range uh, 0.015 to 0.035, so that's about uh, up to about 150 megaparsecs. If you go out to something like uh, uh, redshift of 0.1, so that's more like 300 megaparsecs. 0.06 is about 250. Then the uh, velocity is fading away because there is really no data out there. There are too few supernovae. So the uncertainty is now very large and the p-value has gone up to the point where you don't really have a measurement any longer. But even to explain this velocity at this distance, if you model it as due to a single attractor, which is pulling us, then obviously the further out you go, the heavier this attractor has to be in order to pull you at the observed velocity. And what they're showing here is that you need an attractor mass, which is of order 10 to the 17 solar masses. In other words, as massive as the local Lanakia supercluster in which we are embedded. And uh, Shapley doesn't cut it. Shapley is not massive enough to account for this velocity. Uh, and more to the point, they don't see any infall onto Shapley from the other side, which is what you'd expect if Shapley was the source. And I'm uh, deliberately showing you the data from Find et al, uh, rather than our own, so that uh, you know this is an independent group that came to the same answer. So there is a mystery. We do not yet know what is this great attractor. We have not converged to the CMB dipole as far out as 300 megaparsecs. 260 megaparsecs. And in fact, uh, this has been uh, so confirmed by an, another group, uh, the Six Degree Field Galaxy Survey, uh, done from the Anglo Australian Telescope. And they have actually the largest sample of peculiar velocity measurements. They use the fundamental plane, which is a jargon for uh, a relation for elliptical galaxies between the uh, dispersion of the velocities and the angular diameter, which allows you to infer the distances not very well to maybe about 15% at best. Uh, and they find uh, also a clear departure from the expectation in the standard lambda CDM model. Uh, this was the measurement we had made earlier in 2011, but we had a large error bar. They have a much smaller one. Now, already there is an issue, but you could of course uh, turn this around and say, look, we are in a Gaussian random field. Anything can happen. Maybe we are just rare. Uh, you know, just like we say that we don't see a quadruple on the CMB sky, but that's because we are located in some strange position. From our position, we don't see a quadruple. So if you want to attribute it to cosmic variance, then you can ask, how often does this kind of thing happen? So to answer that, we interrogated these dark sky simulations, and we find that less than 1% of observers like ourselves, local group like observers, would experience a bulk flow as high as we see it. Notice that here it's the absolute value of the bulk flow, not the variance. So one has had to make another assumption that the distribution of velocities is Maxwellian. That's the standard thing done in the literature. So the lesson that one draws from this is that we are flowing faster than expected. We have not converged to the CMB frame. And if this is because we are anomalous, then we are indeed less than 1% likely. And this already has an important implication for cosmology because it means that when you normally use covariances in cosmological analysis, uh, you are assumed to be typical observers, but we are certainly not typical observers. But that's a technical point. I'll come back to that later if I have time. Let me get to my main point now, which is that a clear test for whether or not we are actually moving with this velocity is to look at distant sources and uh, George Ellis and John Baldwin, uh, uh, George Ellis is a relativist, John Baldwin, radio astronomer from the Cavendish lab, uh, 
uh, in Cambridge, they pointed out that very similar to the dipole in the CMB, you should see a dipole in the distribution of high redshift objects because of the same effect, aberration, which all astronomers know, this was actually discovered by Bradley, who was in fact the, uh, the civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford, the position which Joe Silk much later held. And uh, he was looking for parallax, but he discovered that a moving observer actually sees a displacement of objects on the sky, that is aberration. In fact, he estimated the speed of light from this. This was 300 years ago, nearly. And in addition to that, if you look at a uh, object with some spectrum, let's say a power law, then of course you have to allow for Doppler shift because we are not observing the same part of the spectrum as a moving observer as we would as a uh, you know, observer moving with a different velocity. So you take this into account, you do this exercise, standard special relativity, and you get a formula for what is the dipole you would see. And this is expressed here. Again, as you expect, it's d over c cos theta. That term will always be there. This x and alpha refer to the exponents of this power law spectrum of the sources and their integral flux distribution. Very straightforward, very clean, no ambiguity. Uh, you must point out for the benefit of, uh, uh, well, the Greeks in this audience that this was actually calculated at the Orthodox Academy of Crete, where George Ellis tells me that here in 83, there was a cosmology conference and that's where he met John Baldwin and worked this out. And uh, in fact, they were very aware of the significance of what they had found because in the conclusion that say, if the standards of rest determined by the microwave background and the number counts of the radio sources were to be in disagreement, one would have to abandon either the idea that the radio sources are cosmologically distant or the interpretation of the microwave background as relic radiation or the standard Friedman Robertson Walker universe models. So, you know, they were very clear as to the significance of this test. Now, to do this test, what you need is a large number of uh, sources distributed over the sky, ideally at a redshift higher than one, because otherwise there is a problem, which I'll point out here, that the dipole that you will see will be the kinematic dipole, which is what we are looking for, which doesn't depend on distance, just on our velocity. But there will, of course, also be a clustering dipole, because if some sources are accidentally close to us, then of course you can get a dipole simply because there is a source right next door to you. And this you can only avoid by looking at uh, for objects whose redshifts you know and which you can exclude as being nearby. And of course you need a lot of sources because you always will have some poison noise. You don't want a random dipole, but the random dipole is you know random. It can be in any direction. The first test that we did on this was uh, few years ago, uh, five years, four years ago with the radio sources. And this has a catalog, NBSS is from Socorro, New Mexico. And SUMS is a, a survey done from Molonglo in Australia. And we combined them to get a, a full sky survey because of course a ground-based telescope can't see the whole sky. Now, these objects are estimated to be at a redshift around one from their luminosity function. Uh, their redshifts are not directly measured. Uh, so we can only say that the clustering dipole is likely to be negligible. But I'll show you the result from that. We also did it with more galaxies uh, in, from the WISE uh, uh, infrared survey. The infrared, uh, for those who don't know, is because these things uh, in infrared, you can, you're not uh, inhibited by dust absorption as much as you're in the optical. However, the median redshift of these sources, uh, photometric measurements were much closer, 0.14. So there is a significant clustering dipole. So I'll focus in this talk only on the last test we have done, uh, which has just been published in Astrophysical Journal Letters, uh, uh, which is a catalog of about 1.4 million quasars, which have a median redshift of 1.2. And we can actually explicitly show that the expected clustering dipole is negligible. Uh, Subir, I'm afraid you have to start to go fast for the five minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. I'll do that. So let me then skip over estimators of the dipole uh, as to how we estimate the uh, this dipole in the distribution. Uh, just to say that we have checked all this by Monte Carlo, and the measurements we have are unbiased. Now for this NBSS catalog, this was the how they look on the sky. Uh, 
And uh, effectively, we do various quality cuts to remove possible clustering dipoles due to sources in the galactic plane or the supergalactic plane. And we do see the expected cos theta uh, variation on the sky. And you can actually see the dipole with your eye. However, the problem is that although the direction of this is consistent with the CMB dipole, the velocity is not consistent. The velocity is significantly higher. Now, this should not have been a surprise. This was actually detected earlier by Ashok Singhal, a radio astronomer in India. But uh, he had only uh, NBSS, not SUMS as well. And people criticized him for that. And also, even with 800,000 sources, if I do a Monte Carlo simulation of the sky, you would find that you can get a dipole as large as that about 0.25% of the time, which is not seems like much, but for particle physicists, it is less than three sigma. So it's not worth uh, you know, getting excited about. So I give you now our punchline, which is the latest result with quasars, where uh, we have mapped them, as I said, with the WISE uh, satellite. And the lead author on this is Nathan Seacrest at uh, uh, the Washington uh, Naval Observatory, who was involved in this. And the other authors are Mohammad Ramiz at the Tata Institute in Bombay, uh, Sebastian von Hausiger, who is with me at Oxford, and Ruya Mohai and Jacques Collin, who are at the Institute for Astrophysics in Paris. Now, we know that these quasars are at redshift uh, more than one because uh, we were lucky enough that part of some of subset of them have been uh, measured by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in the uh, EBOS program. And this is the measured spectroscopic redshifts of these quasars. And you can see that uh, what I said earlier is true. They are at a redshift higher than one. Less than 1% 1 of these objects are non-quasars. I mean, there's some stellar contamination. They could be very close by. But 99% of them are quasars and are high redshifts. So therefore, when we compute the dipole, which you can actually see with your naked eye again, once we smooth the distribution, we can now ask, how does this compare with the null hypothesis, which is that uh, the dipole is entirely due to our velocity as given by the CMB. And we find again that as before with the radio sources, it is not the case. The directions are consistent with each other. Uh, they're within 20 degrees. But here is the expectation for what dipole we should see in the quasars based on the assumption that the CMB dipole is kinematic. And the spread is because of the uncertainties in the flux distribution and in the spectrum. We generate 10 million skies, and this is the distribution. But the actual observation is out here. And only five of those 10 million simulations can get up this high. So our p-value literally is 5, 10 to the minus 7, which corresponds for a one-sided distribution to 4.9 sigma. And uh, all our data and code is public, and we would like it very much if others would uh, use this catalog and do their own tests uh, and uh, you know, either confirm or contradict what you have said, because this is of uh, fundamental importance, as I've indicated. Uh, let me finish, because I probably am running out of time, by saying that uh, people may believe that Planck has actually confirmed the uh, kinematic origin of the CMB dipole. And they did publish a paper with a rather nice title, a Pussy Move, in which they say that they try to detect the effect of this aberration on the higher multiples. Uh, you see, when you have a boost, you break statistical isotropy explicitly. So you induce correlation between the higher multiples, and they look for this effect. And in one direction, they do see a possible departure from the null hypothesis, uh, not in the orthogonal ones. But as you can tell from what they measured, this detection is less than three sigma. Their uncertainties are just too large. More recently, they have also tried to measure this effect in the thermal synapse Zeldovic effect. But as Notari and Quata pointed out, this does not actually test the physical origin of the dipole. So therefore, uh, I say uh, conclude that the kinematic origin of the CMB dipole is seriously in question. It does not uh, imply a dipole in the quasars that, is, uh, that matches what we observe. So the rest frame of distant matter and the rest frame of the CMB is not the same. Now, for lack of time, I'll skip over this thing that I had there on what impact this has on supernova analysis. Uh, just to say that in supernovae, we find that there is a, the acceleration that is attributed to the cosmological constant seems to have a dipole in the same direction. And this could be a general relativistic effect that uh, uh, Christos Sagas and collaborators have pointed out. Uh, 
uh, X-ray clusters show a similar asymmetry in the same direction. And uh, it, the bottom line that we, I come to is that uh, there is a dipole uh, which is in the same direction uh, as the CMB dipole that we see in the velocities of the host galaxies of supernovae that we also see in the inferred acceleration. And therefore, uh, one important conclusion is that uh, the inference that the acceleration of the Hubble expansion is due to a cosmological constant may be, uh, we may have been misled into thinking that. We think it's a local effect due to our the being embedded in a bulk flow, uh, which is in that direction. And uh, the implication of the rest frame of the quasars not being as the same as the rest frame in is the same is uh, isotropic uh, is rather profound. Uh, there has been some speculation about this some years ago, mainly by uh, Jim Gunn, the astronomer, who pointed out a possible intriguing connection between the larger than expected peculiar velocities, the possibility that the CMB dipole may not be entirely kinematic in nature, and the possibility of superhorizon fluctuations, which by the grischuk zeldovich effect can actually affect what is happening within our uh, patch of space-time. And uh, I would also like to mention that this is an example of what was referred to by George Ellis as the cosmological fitting problem, that if you live in an imperfect universe and you try to match data to an idealized cosmology that underlies it, there will necessarily be ambiguities and degeneracies that you have to cope with. And if you do not take this into account, uh, the physical conclusions that we draw may well be mistaken. So I conclude by saying that uh, this simple test that we have done shows that the standard assumptions of isotropy and homogeneity are questionable. And therefore, so is the inference that the universe is dominated by dark energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, very interesting. Uh, we, it makes us think, well, we, saw, we have seen, of course, this work many years before. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Uh, Norm, yes, please, there are many questions. Norma, make it short, please. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, without uh, going to the implications uh, these uh, measurements uh, results could have and consequences, uh, I, um, what, do you, uh, what do you think about, uh, because I have not seen in your, in your presentation, uh, the the work of the bar, bar flow um, w made uh, uh, com combining uh, x rays clusters a very high statistic sample and uh, and CMB from uh, NASA group uh, uh, Kashelinsky et al. I mean a series of papers Apichi letters and so on um, Apichi. Uh, several years ago, of course, in the 2005 to some 2008. Uh, yes, I'm aware uh, of that paper. You are referring to Kashlinsky, Atrio Barandela, etc., who uh, uh, said yes. that from by measuring the kinematic Sunayev Zeldovich effect, yes, that inferred a dark flow, which actually is at the level of 800 to 1000 kilometers per second and extended out several hundred megaparsecs. So, yes. in this plot, what you will see is that Planck uh, uh, said that it had ruled out such a flow because you can see the upper limit that the set uh, is at the level of about 400 kilometers per second at, a, uh, at the up to the scale at which this dark flow was supposed to extend. And secondly, the work that was done in the supernova factory uh, 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 study by, uh, uh, this is uh, Find et al. Uh, they also find that the bulk flow extends out, but not beyond a few hundred megaparsecs. Well, to be fair, they don't have data beyond that. So this doesn't actually tell you whether or not the dark flow exists. But Planck also uh, did the same uh, kinetic sunayev zeldovich measurements, and they claim to have ruled it out. Now, I'm aware that Atsuyo Barandela questions this result, and he believes that the, uh, the Planck analysis needs reassessment in view of the, the uncertainty estimates and that they could be compatible with uh, what they had originally found. Um, I'm afraid I'm not technically competent to uh, comment on, uh, you know, uh, on the issue, uh, 
but I obviously, uh, like you, follow the dark flow question uh, with much interest. Yes, if, if I allow just one second, that could be interesting, I mean, with all, uh, with all that, because they, they advance also an interesting interpretation, irrespective, I mean, of the, of the number you clearly are showing in this plot. And the interpretation is that it could be also originated from pre-inflationary fluctuations. Exactly. Which goes super yeah. horizon, and which that, could that's... apply also for all the, uh, for what you explained. So thank you. Quite right. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this possibility was actually first raised, in fact, by Jim Gunn, who is an observational astronomer. Yeah. And he correctly pointed out that such a fluctuation, moreover, could not be adiabatic. Uh, because then there is the exact cancellation and it would need to be isocurvature. And actually, I believe, uh, I don't know if David Langlua is online. Uh, David and Sui Piran, in fact, uh, written papers on the possibility of superhorizon isocurvature perturbations. Of course, you would have to argue that they happen for some reason to be aligned with the CMB direction, uh, unless you can uh, also develop a model in which all these things are connected in some way. But you are quite right. This is a very interesting uh, issue to uh, to think about. Thank you, Elias. Uh, Subir, um, as you know, of course, the issue of uh, deviations from homogeneity has been discussed in the past a lot. And I remember at least 20 years ago, there was a discussion of trying to, to compute corrections by starting, let's say, from the homogeneous model corrections that could come precisely from inhomogeneities at different scales. Now, what is the status of this? Is there a formalism that can compute such corrections so that eventually one can quantify what is the impact on I'm these afraid. models? Yeah, I understand. So you may be referring to the formalism that was presented by Thomas Buchert, who is at Lyon, and he pointed out that if you, in fact, uh, 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 do averaging uh, uh, of these fluctuations. So then you get a term in the Friedman equation, which is proportional to the variance. And that term, which is come to be called back reaction, actually behaves just like a cosmological constant. It has seems to have effective negative pressure. And therefore, it's kind of interesting that that can mimic uh, this effect of lambda. The problem is that uh, Thomas can do this on a constant time-like surface. Uh, that is the natural way in which you would do the averaging. However, the observations we make are not on constant time-like surfaces. They are on our past light cone, right? And the two don't commute in general relativity. So you have a tricky problem that we want to know uh, how to average over inhomogeneities along our past light cone. That is what all these observations of luminosity distance, uh, uh, you know, angular diameter distance, all these things that we do are sensitive to. But there is no mathematical formalism, to my knowledge, which can do that analytically. Uh, recently, just to finish my answer, uh, the, it has been recognized that the only way you can do this is by doing a, a, a numerical simulation, including general relativity effects. And uh, two or three groups have started doing that. For example, there is a group that was uh, based around uh, Geneva. And they uh, uh, looked at what would be the effect of these uh, fluctuations on our past light cone. However, they too assume that we are typical observers. Okay, And I have discussed this with Rudurar. They do not take into account, as I pointed out here, observationally, that we are not. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah. That, that fact that we are definitely unusual observers, uh, uh, this has not been taken into account yet. I have urged them to do that, but what they do is they pick a random dark halo in the simulation and then ask for effects along the past light cone of that random halo. I've told them that they should do a constraint simulation where they actually fix on something that looks like our local group. That is how you should do it. But needless to say, that is computationally very challenging. These are early days. I mean, they are one of, as I said, only two or three groups that have the technology to do these things. But that is the way forward. You have to do general relativist uh, simulations with GR uh, uh, effects uh, built in. As you know, most of these pretty and body simulations that we see are Newtonian. They're, they don't have general relativity in them at all. Uh, so that would be a way forward to quantify whether back reaction 
uh, can have a important effect because what people say is it goes as the variance of the fluctuations so if the fluctuations are 10 to the minus 5 the variance is 10 to the minus 10 it's clearly negligible but to that you could reply but the variance is of order 1 today and the square of 1 is 1 so it could be of order 1 So you see, theoretically, it's very hard to tell whether the effect is order one or order ten to the minus ten. You can you have to do uh, some hard work to determine this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have to stop the discussion, but I, I profit for the last uh, naive question. If there is a dipole and it looks like we're moving in some direction, how come the acceleration of uh, is I think the data are isotropic, right? Like as no, if... uh, okay. Thank you for that question. The, that's a very good question. And indeed, if that was so, then of course there would be a big puzzle. So what we discovered, if I may fast forward to that for a minute, is that uh, people actually make corrections. So if you look at the supernova data, they actually boost to the CMB frame, and this is from the JLA catalog. And you can see here the redshift that are being quoted. are boosted to the cmb frame assuming that the uh, cmb dipole is entirely kinematic in origin and secondly they correct for the effects of peculiar velocities and to do that uh, sorry sorry about fast forwarding through so many slides but i need to get but, to the yeah, right one here so this is what they do you will recognize this formula because this is just special relativity you are multiplying several special relativistic boosts one is the motion that is induced by our motion with regard with respect to the cmb and here is the motion of the supernova host galaxies with respect to the cmb frame and what we actually put into our cosmology equations is this z which is the z as it would be seen by an ideal observer observing an ideal isotropic universe but we don't live in that universe so when we actually measure the redshift from the heliocentric frame which is where we are we have to make all these corrections to go to that um, uh, you know that idealized universe where the friedman equation holds if uh, two years ago we looked at the corrections that have been applied in the jla catalog and the corrections that are applied uh, basically i call them c here you can see it's the same object and as you can see they have assumed uh, you can tell from this plot that they have assumed that this corrections basically disappear at a distance of 150 megaparsecs in other words they ignore all the evidence that i showed you that the flow is actually continuing beyond that and they have adopted a unphysical model in which the flow abruptly stops at 150 megaparsecs which is violates continuity for a start and also basic uh, dynamics so what we did was to undo the corrections they had done to get the original data uh, corresponding to the heliocentric frame and then we analyze the luminosity distances for the supernovae in a cosmographic analysis so just the hubble parameter and the deceleration parameter and we allow the deceleration parameter to have a directional dependence and we find that if we do that then the deceleration parameter actually is largely a dipole about 50 times bigger than the monopole the monopole is consistent with zero at 1.4 sigma but the dipole is different from zero at 3.9 sigma and this is why i said that the acceleration is also not isotropic it is along the same direction that we are moving and here is a picture that shows you how that q of that q not parameter looks on the sky it's actually uh, you know the with 740 objects i can't give you a good direction but you can see that it is more or less consistent with the direction of the cmb dipole and It is interesting to note that the supernovae that were originally studied by uh, the two uh, groups that uh, discovered cosmic acceleration, they were also mainly in the same direction. Uh, in the opposite direction, there were very few, and the opposite direction, it, they would have actually seen uh, deceleration. We believe. So the problem is that the supernovae do not cover the whole sky; only the nearby supernovae are all sky. Uh, the SNLS collaboration just looked at four little spots on the sky. the sdss collaboration just looked at one strip uh, and the hubble uh, telescope uh, you know they only observed about a dozen so what we really need is an all sky survey of supernovae yeah. in order to determine yes. if this indication is correct or not yes right. thank you thank you very much sorry for the delay uh...
done for the next talk. Thank you again. Thank you. This is great, uh, of course, great uh, uh, food for thought. Thank you. Dan, can you share your screen? Yeah, maybe as a two. So I saw Mike Hudson had his hand up and I'll. Sorry? I saw Mike Hudson had his hand up as I'm sharing my screen. He could ask his question. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Subir. Um, Hi, Mike. 